to access it through um, through the through the um, number also that should also work. All right.
I think in the next few slides, I'm going to like go over the basics, um, kind of just in a little bit more detail for those who have been like seeing it for the first time. Um, so yeah, this is just going to be like a very general like outline of the talk. So first, I'm going to give like an introduction, which is basically just going to be like, what is NLP? Like, what is sentiment analysis? What like machine learning basics do I need to know in order to not be totally lost? Um, two, I'm going to really quickly go over like a high level of um, some of the like like open source like models that that are like used for this type of like text and text um, classification, just like text analysis tasks. Um, and then three, we're going to talk about like okay, so what differentiates like sentiment analysis from like a lot of other text classification tasks? Um, is that uh, sentiment analysis gets real funky sometimes because like the way that humans convey emotion through language gets real funky at times. Um, so this is just going to be kind of from an evaluation perspective. If you have like some sort of like sentiment analysis pipeline, you want to say like, okay, maybe it's like super good in the general case. Maybe it's good when everyone's just like kind of behaving almost exactly as you intend them to. If you want to launch this like on a product or something, like obviously your user base isn't going to like behave as you intend them to, right? So what are some like weird edge cases that could really like trip up the dumbest of dumb like text classification models? And then number five, um, well, first of all, we are a bit shorter on time than originally planned, which is convenient for me because the Jupyter Notebook demo is, is kind of more or less just the same as like the hugging face tutorial. Um, so I, I will kind of like talk through what each line of the code is doing um, in cases like the tutorial itself might not be, be like that easily parsable. Um, but like this is kind of like time depending if we have time to do it. Um, I did compile it all into a notebook. So if you want to like copy that notebook and kind of like build upon it, um, that that's just kind of like gonna all be in one place instead of like needing to read through an entire like blog post or something. Um, so yeah, this is going to be the outline of the talk. Um, all right, introduction. First of all, sentiment analysis. Um, as you can imagine, sentiment analysis is basically just like from a piece of text, you kind of like guess like, is this conveying a positive emotion, negative emotion, something between, something emotion. Um, and actually you see this a lot in like product reviews and such. So like, for example, um, Earlier this summer, I was like looking to like buy an external hard drive because like um, I don't know my computer is like it's okay it, it like has some memory um, it could have more memory so I was like what if I had more memory um, so I was kind of like looking at like hard drives right and then I just like looked at some <coughs> looked at some like sample Amazon reviews like this um, I I just like went out and like just like clicked on Amazon so like. I, what I, I think what I'm trying to convey here isn't necessarily a point that I need to convince you of, which is just that like sentiment analysis is like something that you already kind of like do. It's a task that's very prevalent as humans are kind of like almost doing it every day um, for like a product. Like suppose you're the manufacturer of this, like suppose you're, so it's like, I don't know if that says Colo or Molo. Suppose you're the manufacturer of that hard drive. You kind of like want to get a good sense of whether this product is like performing well. And instead of like, I don't know, like paying some guy to just like read through a bunch of Amazon reviews, you can really easily automate this process if you have a pipeline that does this sentiment analysis for you. Then you can kind of like track also like how well is your product been doing over time. So like, I guess like these are, um, these are just kind of like two polar opposites. There's one person saying like, oh my God, this is like literally the best thing since like sliced bread. This one is like, uh, this doesn't have enough memory, zero stars. I just don't remember how many stars they gave it, but these are kind of like two very different sentiments that are being echoed. Okay, so like kind of a very high level of how sentiment analysis works, kind of reframing this problem in a more like traditionally machine learning context. So for now, to simplify things, we're gonna treat sentiment as a binary classification. So like if, this is like a good sentiment, a positive sentiment, we're just gonna say it's like a one. And if it's like a negative sentiment, we're gonna say it's a zero. Um, and the reason we're doing this now is cause it makes it easier to like introduce, um, makes the math easier. So it's just kind of kind of like be this single scale, like this single axis scale. Um, 
and what what the model does is it's just going to like do this little calculation thing going to predict a floating point in the range of like 0 1 and then what we say now is like the smaller numbers that are closer to zero, that means the sentiment is more negative, and the larger numbers are like closer to one, which means the sentiment is like more positive. Um, and again, I want to emphasize by saying this is kind of like an extreme oversimplification of the range of human emotion. You can argue about like how you can be like both happy and sad at the same time. Like that is totally possible for now, um, and actually for a lot of sentiment analysis tasks, if you're just looking at, oh, people like buy this product when they're happy and they don't buy it when they're not happy. If that's all you care about, then this simplification you would find to be very, very like um, effective already. So uh, high level steps of this. So what? You gotta like tokenize your input text. We'll get a little into what that means later. Then you gotta just like pass your tokenized text through your model. It's gonna do its little computing stuff. Um, and then you're going to just kind of like um, compute your loss back from this is the training process of it. And finally you would get a trade model that you can use to like do your sentiment analysis. All right, so um, text tokenization. So how do we turn this sentence getting a little bit, I don't know, do you call it getting a little bit meta or do you call it getting a little bit lazy because you didn't want to like come up with another sentence? How do we turn this sentence into something a neural network can understand? So tokenization is when you take this like string of words and then you just like split it into tokens. So tokens would be like a word or sometimes a word part. Like for example, we have like snowflake. That would sometimes that would be like one token. Sometimes that would be two tokens like snow and flake. Um, so so like word parts, word affixes, prefixes, suffixes, etc. Those would be tokens. And then punctuations would also be their own separate token because they hold like a separate semantic meaning. Um, and then, for example, this above sentence, one way to tokenize it would be like this. And here, essentially, all I've done, I haven't done anything like super fancy. You could argue that some tokenizers would like try to split, I guess, like understand. I don't know. This one is like a little bit iffy because under and stand have two very distinct meanings from the word understand. Similarly, for like network, I guess like network isn't really like a net that works. Um, something similarly, like you can you can argue either way for some of these for the sake of simplification. I just keeping like each word as separate, but you can also see how some tokenizers would try to split like one word into multiple multiple pieces. I think maybe a better example would be like walking, running, like the ing part. You can argue would be a separate token because it has it like kind of alters the meaning. And that would be another way of representing it. Um, depends on your tokenizer. And then you would represent each word using an integer. And this is for the purpose of, well, your your model like doesn't read. It, it like knows numbers. Um, so this is going to, again, be an oversimplification of what the model would actually be doing if you were, for example, using like a hugging face library. I'm just going to be lazy and say like number these from like zero through however many tokens unique tokens are in there. So that's going to be like a vector. So if you're kind of like familiar with um, mach like machine learning in like, just kind of like in any like non NLP setting, you're like, okay, this looks familiar, right? Like for example, images, I got like pixels and stuff for like any like regression task, I got like my um, data vector. So like now you've turned your sentence into like a data vector. Um, and well, this is just one sentence. <coughs> What, what happens now is like if we have like a bunch of different sentences that we want to do. So this is getting closer and closer to if you're familiar with kind of like um, organizing your data sets for machine learning. This is getting closer and closer to what that is going to be. So that's going to be your first sentence. And then I just like put some more sentences in here. <coughs> you kind of notice that a lot of these is going to um, repeat a lot of the words for previously. And you'll also notice that these are all kind of like of different lengths. So this is where padding comes in, and this is because, well, our model also doesn't like it when our matrices are like weirdly shaped. Um, so what happens, and this again is an oversimplification, but you're basically going to like take your theme, and wherever you have uneven sentence lengths, you're going to just fill it with padding. And then um, what you do is you just like tell your neural network, oh, by the way, like these are just like padding tokens, like 
which means there weren't any words there, but you don't need to like pay attention to that. Um, so this is kind of like for the purposes of making it easier to train. Alrighty. Yeah, so, so your attention mask um, is going to be slightly different from like the attention and transformers, which we will get to in a moment, but that's just kind of telling you, hey, by the way, like don't pay attention to like these padding tokens. I did that because the language is funky. Um, Alright, so getting into the model side of things, so we kind of finished our data pre-processing step. Now we're going into that kind of like step two of the overall like, um, what's it called, the model theme. Oh, I forgot to do the second slide of questions, didn't I? Uh, it's okay. But that was just asking you what you thought sentiment analysis was. I imagine y'all probably had a pretty good idea of what sentiment analysis is, um, so I don't think any of you missed out on too much by not getting to voice you think sentiment analysis is analyzing sentiment. Um, all right. <laughs> so, okay, so neural networks, um, kind of like judging from the response that I received in the survey, a lot of you probably are like somewhat familiar already with what neural networks are, especially if you've like taken O36 or anything like that. So this would probably be a review. Um, but again, like reviews can't hurt. Um, and if I say anything wrong, you can probably call me out on it, which is good. Um, all right. So the overall idea of like neural networks is you're just kind of like, um, especially for a classification task, you want to learn some function that takes you from your inputs to your outputs. And then your neural network just learns this like super complex nonlinear mapping from your inputs to your outputs. Um, so your neural network, uh, the main thing that differentiates it from like for example linear regression or logistic progression is that it consists of multiple layers, and then each one applies just like a single like operation that's kind of like nonlinear um, to the input, and you just kind of like recursively keep on applying layers, and that's how you kind of like compose this whole like mapping that's incredibly like complex and allows you to like predict trends from very very um, complicated data so for nlp there are like two types of neural net layers um to understand and as you could kind of guess so the first is like fully connected layers is just kind of like the most basic type of neural net layer um, but i think you kind of like want to know what's going on there because the fully connected layer is a component of the transformer layer, which is kind of like the core like unit of language models. Um, and if you were here previously, you also got like a preview of transformers, which is really good. Um, all right, so about fully connected layers, um, here you have like your input, I'm just going to assume simplicity for now, and say we'll always be dealing with a single input. You're gonna have like a vector of number that's gonna be of like n, you pass it through the layer, you get your output, which is another vector of numbers, which is of length m. So if you can imagine you started with like your first like sentence vector, you just keep on like passing it through a bunch of layers. Um, suppose like for some reason you wanted to use a fully connected network um, for uh, text analysis, which you do you, but um, don't do that. Uh, this, this is kind of like what you would be doing if you can imagine like you take the output of that, you feed it into the next layer, it's still a one by whatever vector. So you just keep on getting like, you keep on getting maps to different vector spaces until you finally get mapped into like, this like real, real valued number, um, which would be like a length one vector basically. Um, and then, yeah, just kind of like a pictorial representation. This is your input to the layer. Your layer itself consists of, um, layer weights, so this is kind of just like a matrix multiplication, um, and then once you apply your weights to it, you'll get kind of like your pre-activation step. So this is just going to be your linear transformation, but if you recall, like if you were just to stop here and say, okay, let's pass this bad boy into the next layer, like you would essentially be doing a really, really complicated like linear, like basically just a linear operation on whatever your input was, which would be mathematically equivalent to linear regression. You can make some arguments about like, oh, the rank of the matrix is like different depending on like what you did in the middle. Um, but the key of neural networks is that we want to introduce some nonlinearity into it. So like, there's like only one place left to like put that nonlinearity, which is in the activation, right after you put it into your pre-activation. You put it into your activation and you get your output, which is post-activation. This is how language works. So um, this is kind of like the 
overall of the fully connected layer. Um, and then, well, now that you have the Ruby of the fully connected layer, um, we're going to get into the transformer. Okay, so this looks a lot more complicated um, than, than the previous slide, and that's because it is, um, but don't worry about it. So um, what we have over here is, um, so your feed forward is the same as the fully connected layer as your previous slide. Um, for your transformer, you have kind of like two, two different like pieces you want in code. So here is like your inputs, um, and then your outputs is kind of like saying, you have this one token, what's your next token? So it's gonna be like your inputs, but it kind of like shifted a bit. Um, and then what you have here, okay, is, is going to be your attention layer. And this is kind of like the key of what makes like transformers different from like, just like a normal like feed forward layer. So, um, so basically like, this was kind of like discussed previously, but um, you have like your different like, um, you have like your different matrices, so this is like a key, a value, and a query. And what your attention is trying to do is you're basically just trying to say like out of the sentence, like which parts like should I pay the most attention to? Like which parts are the most important? So like for example, your key and your query, you're kind of like trying to take the dot products, so you're trying to like find where they like coincide the most. Um, this like uh, square root of like DK, this is just kind of like a normalization being to like make the map a little bit nicer. Um, and then finally, you're kind of like multiplying this by like your value matrix, um, or uh, this this softmax um, is, is kind of just, again, like a mathematical nicety. Um, but overall, what this attention, um, what this like attention matrix would tell you is kind of like which parts in, in the, in, in, in like the input sequence you kind of like want to pay attention to. So like, again, um, I'm kind of talking about attention, like I'm using self-attention um, to describe attention because it's kind of like the general idea of what the transformer is. Um, and then like, essentially, once you have this, you um, you kind of like put it back into the feed forward and then you just kind of like, um, you kind of like do your linear and your like soft max. Um, and then that is what you get as like the, um, as the probabilities, um, or, or like if you want to pass it through another layer, instead of doing like your linear softmax, you just like pass it through another transformer. Um, so this is kind of like the modification to the fully connected network that kind of like makes it slightly better for, um, or actually makes it a lot better for just like language tasks. Um, actually makes it a lot better for vision tasks as well. Um, uh, but that's a little bit out of the scope of what I'm going to get to today. Um, so these are transformers. And then finally, the last step is um, regardless of what was in the like center of like your neural network, um, hopefully it was transformers and not fully connected layers. Um, but at the end, you kind of like want to, assuming again, your sentiment is kind of like on just this single real valued scale, you're going to want to output some real number like output some real number between zero and one. So right now your model would just like output some real number period. And what you can do is you can pass it through the sigmoid function. So this is like basically the logistic function and this will map your real number to some value that's between zero and one. The more negative it is, the closer to zero, the more positive it is, the closer to one. Um, and the reason that we would do that and not, I guess, just like leave it as, um, as a real number, which I guess might also work um, is that you kind of like want to like have a bound. It makes it mathematically nicer for when you're trying to like um, train your model. So this is kind of like if you were to um, kind of like take the uh, derivative of of um, of your sigmoid and kind of like set it to zero. Uh, this is this would kind of like be the loss function that you get. Um, kind of going just a little more into detail, this would be like your uh, log likelihood. Um, if you think about it, like your likelihood is if you had like um, your output for for like probability of being one, like raised to raised to this power versus like the probability of the other one raised to the other power, that's kind of like what those two terms it just kind of mathematically makes it nicer depending on what your classification actually is. And then because it's just like easier to work with in the log space instead of in the likelihood space, 
because addition is easier than like multiplication. Um, that's kind of like the function that you get. All right, so um, that's kind of like a very high level overview of kind of like basics you need to know for this. Um, all right, kind of going again quite high level into some models that you might see. Um, all right, so the first model that we're going to um, look at is like the BERT model. So this one, um, kind of like the overall idea here is that when you're like doing your training, you kind of like, you want to make your attention like basically bi-directional instead of unidirectional. Um, then that's what the B in BERT stands for is like a bi-directional one. Uh, another detail about BERT is that like when you're doing the pre-training, what it does is it kind of like does some masks on some words and then it tries to like predict what those words are. Um, okay. All right, Roberta is uh, very similar to BERT, um, except it's done using like a different pre-training scheme. It uses larger batches um, and in kind of like, uh, what is it? Yeah, dynamic masking. Um, and then honestly, like there's a lot of models. Um, so it would be kind of like a lot of time to kind of go into what all of them are doing. Um, talked about BERT and Roberta. XLNet is kind of like another, um, another model you could use in which case it's like, instead of like, it's kind of like doing a permut per permutation like comparison um, between like different tokens. This still BERT is like basically trained on like the inputs outputs of BERT. Um, Falcon and Llama are like slightly larger models, um, but also like more expressive than the previous. And then GPT, again, as I mentioned, it will work a lot better than some of these smaller models by virtue of simply having more expressive power. The downside is that like you gotta like pay OpenAI to use it. Um, and that it also can be kind of slow. Uh, what it is useful for, though, I will say, is um, like data augmentation. So, like uh, in the next session, I'm going to kind of like get into like edge cases that you might want to like evaluate your models on. So these would be like hard examples. Um, and you could, I think, like um, use GPT to help like generate some of these so that you have like kind of like a larger like hard eval set. Um, all right, some special cases. Um, I guess like context. Um, this you 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 can't really look at this and say this is like a positive or a negative. Um, <laughs> like here you could say um, okay, so you you should like you do have the context of this is like a bed. Um, if you just had I ordered this I broke it because I thought it was a giant ice cream sandwich. You can't tell if it's positive or negative. Um, this. In this case, like it really would help. Um, even if without the one star review, this one I admit may, might be a bad example. I included it because it was funny. This one is might be a bad example because it does have like one star out of five. Um, if you can imagine like this appearing in a different context where there isn't a star rating attached to it, you would kind of like need the context of oh maybe you want it multimodal. You want like the ice cream sandwich bed in there. You want like the entire preceding like um, corpus of text versus like just your just the isolated sample. Um, okay, sarcasm. All right, so this again is very difficult to tell whether or not is like positive or negative. Um, I think perhaps an even more interesting task is for the model to be able to tell this is sarcasm at all. Um, as humans, we can kind of like know that it is sarcasm due to the sheer absurdity of it. Um, I think uh, for for a model itself, sarcasm kind of tying into sentiment analysis, like a less um, captivating example would be like, oh, this is so great. Like you can't really tell without like the tone of voice, like if great refers to this actually is great or it's like it's bad, but I'm saying it's great because I'm being sarcastic about it. Um, all right, negations. I think uh, this is kind of like, again, no doesn't necessarily mean negative. This is kind of like related to uh, a larger problem within NLP in that like, just kind of like logical phrases that kind of like relate things to one another tend to be more difficult. So like, um, if you say something is not blah, 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 like the model needs to like be able to remember that not remember it's like a negation. Um, I guess like I did mark the negations in this phrase. Um, and then like in the context of, again, sentiment analysis, 
you could say, okay, this is like positive. Well, there's a five star review attached to it, of course, but like I got 50% better. Like you could say that that's, you could say that that is a positive. You could also say that that is sarcasm. So again, like a lot of these tricky edge cases are like tied to each other. Um, I will say some of these are even tricky to figure out as humans. This one is not sarcasm because we have the star review attached to it. Um, if we did it, it might g genuinely be difficult to tell, again, unless we had context. So going back to that slide, but um, yeah. Uh, last one, emojis. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so again, emojis are a little bit tricky because they are a separate alphabet. Um, they're kind of like this pictographic alphabet that's used in conjunction with our actual alphabet. And again, they're used in kind of like ways that you wouldn't necessarily conventionally expect based on their like literal meaning. So um, basically, all of these like hard cases I described, they're hard not only in sentiment analysis, but just like in like NLP when you're kind of analyzing what people would write online. Um, and sentiment analysis, just because it happens to be like a very prevalent case of where you would analyze what people write online, happens to touch upon all of these. Um, rip Uncle Mark, but um, okay, one last, one last thing, and this is a little bit separate from the others because this is going to go and kind of like mess up the assumption we made initially that like sediment exists on like this um, single axis scale. So like neutral text, um, there are multiple ways to look at it. So one way is just say like, okay, if we had our model like predict um, some real number value, if this value is like sufficiently close to zero or like after we sigmoid it, it falls within this range, we can say, okay, that's neutral in in which case we're regarding positive and negative sentiment as complete opposites. Another thing we could say, and this is tied into, again, the sliding scale assumption, is if we have mutual text that's like totally irrelevant, we may want to consider it as a separate class entirely, in which case now we have like different classes. We have like a negative class, a mutual class, and a positive class, um, and then we would apply kind of like multi-class classification instead, in which case we would just need to extend our like um, our our like logistic uh, or or self max activation into like um, into multiple classes, um, and then and then basically the loss itself would also extend to multiple classes. Okay, so other hard tasks. Um, I didn't I didn't get a chance to include these mainly because I couldn't find funny images that um, exemplified them. Um, Okay, benchmark data sets, this is going to be really quick, um, but these are just kind of like some common data sets that you could use kind of like as a first pass. Um, maybe you could scour these for examples of like, of the tricky cases that I've described before, um, but these are just kind of like a different um, sentiment analysis data sets. You'll, you will notice that like a lot of these are kind of like um, treating the labels differently as I discussed, so IMDB, um, Amazon polarity, they're kind of just like, okay, it's going to be two classes. <coughs> Tweet and Val now has like zero through 20. That's like a lot of classes. Um, and then financial phrase book will have just like three, three different classes, including a neutral class. Um, sentiment 140 just kind of like has um, like what, like five different classes. So it's just kind of like, they are kind of like relatively um, comparable, but you will like be treating neutrality as like a different class um, and then yeah I think if, if you want to like take a look at the code it's, it's just um, we are we are almost at time but this is kind of like just a Jupyter notebook that would like um, help you with the stuff because it keeps like all the code in one place um, you can make a copy of it uh, I think um, is there is there a way to make these like slides available or if not like just um, yeah, just, I think, if you were able to, like, see the owner of, of this or whatever, um, of, of the notebook, just, like, send me a contact. But, yeah, that is that is everything. Um, thank you for sticking around with this presentation. Um, I'm a bit hosed, as you can tell. Um, but thank, thank you for showing up. Um, nonetheless, and I hope you learned something from this presentation or at least were entertained.
want to do any questions, or we also have insomnia cookies, so we can distribute them now. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, I mean like we we have like five hundred questions.